right. So to begin, we'll talk a little bit about what is stony coral tissue loss disease and why are we having this workshop? So stony coral tissue loss disease is a disease that affects stony corals. For those of you that are not very familiar with corals, we have what we call soft corals, which are sea fans or sea pens, but we also have hard corals. These are the corals that provide structure. They're the architects of our reef. So stony coral tissue loss disease affects these hard corals. It was first detected in 2014 off Miami-Dade County in Florida. And this coincided with the hottest summer on record and the hottest winter on record. So you can see um, some of the peaks here for the warmest summer on record and the warmest winter on record. And what does this mean? This means that they had some major bleaching events. And for those of you that are not familiar with bleaching, bleaching is when corals release the algae that lives within its tissues and they lose their color. This is caused because of certain stress. It could be temperatures. Um, it could be um, other stresses like sedimentation, lack of light. They might begin to bleach. Along that same time, there was some major dredging of the Miami port. This is not to say that these are the reasons that are causing stony coral tissue loss disease. But it is possible that all of these aliens of corals that make them more prone to disease. Um, fast forward now in 2000, or sorry, in 2015, the disease started moving north through Broward County. Um, 2016, sorry, Palm, all the way to Palm Beach and all the way to Martin County um, in the north and the upper Keys right here. 2018 all the way to low key, 2019 all the way to Key West. And now in 2020, we see that almost all of the Florida reef track now has stony coral tissue loss disease, except for the Dry Tortugas National Park. And also now we know that the disease is present in 18 countries, um, including Honduras. It started first in Florida. Um, now we have it in Bahamas, Cayman, Jamaica, Turks and Caicos, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, USVI, VVI, San Martin, um, and San Eustatius, Washa. And in our Mesoamerican reef, which is the second largest barrier reef in the world, uh, and is shared by four countries, Mexico, Belize, uh, Guatemala, and Honduras, it's now present in Mexico, Belize, and Honduras. Currently, we know that the disease um, is present on the south side of Roatan in a com near a community called Flowers Bay. Um, and how does uh, stony coral tissue, tissue loss look um, physically? So it appears initially at the edge of the colony and it might spread upwards. And it's characterized by the freshly exposed white intact skeleton. And this is important to know the difference between tissue loss and bleaching, which I mentioned before. So in the image at the top, we see tissue loss where we're losing the skin or the tissue that covers the skeleton of the coral. And this, this leaves a white intact skeleton. And this white intact skeleton is very important because the disease happens so quickly, the tissue loss happens so quickly that there isn't enough time for allergies to colonize that white skeleton. And so that's why we see that freshly white skeleton in colonies that are presenting symptoms. And bleaching, which is, as I mentioned previously, when tissue of the coral loses its suicanteli or that symbiotic algae that lives within its tissues and it leaves a white tissue. So here we see um, white tissue without the suicanteli and there we see um, slightly normal tissue. Lesions can, uh, can also start as small patches or little spots that as the disease progresses can then get larger um, and merge into larger lesions. Another thing that's very characteristic about stony coral tissue loss is the number of species that are affected. It affects over 22 different species of corals um, and the succession of the disease is also very characteristic of stony coral tissue loss. It'll start in the highly susceptible species which we'll discuss in depth once we go through our coral ID um, slides, but the highly susceptible species are basically pillar corals, um, mace corals, flower corals, and a lot of our brain corals. Once it affects these highly susceptible species, then it'll move into the intermediate species, which are boulder corals, which are the ones we're gonna discuss today. 
And there's also some species that present stony coral tissue loss, but we don't know the susceptibility, whether they're highly or intermediate. These could be um, lettuce corals, which won't go through those in our presentations, but we will go through, for example, spiny flower coral um, and golf ball coral, Fabia fragum. So first it'll show itself in Mandrina mandritas, and do not worry if right now these scientific names um, don't mean anything to you, they will. And um, let me go real quick through your questions. This is, will this webinar be available to watch on your website after the live presentation? We are recording the webinar. We will post it on our YouTube channel. Um, so don't worry. And I will also, after you finish the workshop, I will send you all the slides and um, all of the resources. So it'll present itself first in the mace corals, which their scientific name is Mandrina mandritis. Um, don't worry about that right now. Moving on to flower corals and then elliptical star corals. Um, it will then move to the pillar corals and the brain corals. These are the species. After it goes through these highly susceptible species, it will move on into the intermediate susceptible, which are um, star corals, boulder corals, blushing corals, um, and we'll go through all of those today. And something to keep in mind is the gray variability by which this disease presents itself. It could be anything, uh, you know, it could be like one tiny polyp that's presenting tissue loss. It could be a larger lesion, but um, if you're in the water, if you're diving, make sure to get close to the corals without touching them, right? But getting close enough to see whether it's bleaching, because right now with the storms and the high temperatures of the water, we are seeing bleaching in our reef. So go and look closely and see if there's really tissue loss there. These, for example, are um, seven colonies of mace coral. And these um, all are presenting symptoms of stony coral tissue loss disease. But as you can see, there is very great variability with you, how you can see it. For example, here we see abnormal patterns of bleaching, um, rapid tissue loss. Sometimes we just see one large um, lesion. And um, as I've seen it firsthand in Flowers Bay, um, and it's very variable, but you will see um, some of these butterfly fish kind of nipping off some of the dead tissue that's kind of sloughing off. Um, so if you see any mace corals around the West End, West Bay, Sandy Bay area, please take pictures, um, note the dive site and send us images. And I will leave you the, the contact email at the end of this, of this webinar. Another of the highly susceptible species is elliptical star coral. And again, it could be one polyp that's losing tissue. It could be several lesions. It could be one large lesion. So really the key is looking at, is there tissue loss? And are there other colonies around that colony that I'm looking at that are also presenting symptoms? Because this disease can move very rapidly among corals of the same species, but also corals of different species. So if we see several mace corals presenting symptoms, we might see a pillar coral as well or a brain coral, then that's something we definitely need to keep an eye on. And just for you to have an idea, these are some of the symptoms that we're seeing in, in Roatan. So we're looking at the highly susceptible species right now, which are mace corals right here. As you can see that bright white skeleton, this is all um, basically loss of tissue. It's not present in this um, brain coral yet, but so we're seeing it in the mace coral. And here's a close up of what this tissue loss would look like once you get really up close with the coral. These are other of the highly susceptible species. Um, flower coral, it could be just one um, or two polyps of the flower coral that are rapidly spreading to others. And um, this pillar coral, this is um, almost what we would say like textbook. Um, stony coral tissue loss disease, different lesions that might be starting upward or downward, large lesions. And if you look closely, you can see the, the tissue loss. And we did find some uh, brain corals. This is a uh, Copophilia natans, and I will go in. I'm not familiar with the science, the um, that we found. And for you to get an idea of how quickly this disease can move, this image was from Wednesday when we got the report that there might be stony coral tissue loss disease. 
image on the bottom is from Thursday when we went and did the, the, recon the field uh, inspection. And you can see how in a matter of days, we've lost this little bit of tissue right there. So that's how quickly you can um, detect or how quickly we can lose tissue loss. So I would recommend if you see colonies that look suspicious, again, take a picture, note the dive site, email us to setld at roatanmarinepark.com. And also, if you are a dive professional diving frequently, make sure to go the next day, see how rapidly the disease is progressing. There are other diseases among corals that can cause tissue loss, such as white plague. Um, so it could be possible that it is not stony coral tissue loss disease, but the best would be to take a picture, note the dive site, and email us. Um, these are healthy pillar corals in Florida prior to the disease. Um, and this is just for you to get an idea of what we might be looking at in a couple of um, months to years. Right, so this is my, the end of the section on stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, and I'll just open the floor now to see if any of you have any questions in regards to stony coral tissue loss disease before we move on um, to the coral identification part. Let's see in our Q&A, nope. All right, nope, I don't see any questions. Jared, if you have a question, feel free to type it in the Q&A or in the chat box. Or actually, it looks like I can allow you to talk. Okay, let's see, allow. Okay, Jared, you can actually do your question yourself. Okay, is it possible that trash causes that too? You know, it's hard to tell. We know that, um, it's moving with stony coral tissue loss. It's moving in, in the ocean currents. Some scientists say that it might be traveling in ballast water from cargo boats, um, divers themselves. So, I mean, I don't know the answer for that for sure, but it is possible that some of the trash that's moving through our ocean currents might have stony coral tissue loss disease. Right yeah, now, the recommendation. Yes, go ahead. Uh, a few years ago, I dived in front of the um, basketball court in front of Flores Bam, and it was full of trash, and all the corals that were around it looked like they were dying. That could be possible. It could be possible. We know um, that corals need sunlight. So if there is, you know, large islands of trash that are sitting on top of corals for a long time, that could cause also some of the corals to to lose that suicentelli that needs light to create food and might cause them to look a bit um, not too good. So it could be um, disease, but it could be other environmental factors as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to move on to the other um, to the other part of our, our Coral ID workshop. And before I begin with that, um, I do want to invite you guys all to be monitors because every time you go diving, um, you if you spend five minutes doing a rapid survey of the area you're at and noting if you see any of these susceptible species with symptoms, you're already helping us a lot because we do have very limited personnel at the Roatan Marine Park. And so you guys are basically our eyes in the water. So that's why we're hosting all of these workshops so that all of you guys can get familiar with the species, with the symptoms, and that you can help us um, keep track of how this disease is spreading and how quickly it's spreading. Last week, I was able to conduct some rapid surveys in the some areas in West Bay, West Sun and Sandy Bay. I'm happy to report we didn't see any symptoms of the disease, but it's something that we have to keep monitoring um, on a weekly basis. So with that said, um, I work, I'm gonna move on to the coral ID part. Okay, sorry about that. Oops, that is not it, sorry. All right, and in the meantime, Michael, if you have a question, um, feel free to type it in the chat box um, or we can leave some space for questions at the end of the, of the webinar session. Go ahead and share my screen. All 
All right, so the presentations that I'll be using are from the AGRA website. This is the Atlantic Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment. Um, and they were created by Judith Lang and Kenneth Marks, basically created this methodology to survey corals um, in the Caribbean. So I do wanna give credit to them. This is not my presentation. I'm just um, using this as a, a resource for you guys to, to learn. I'm pretty sure that you can find these online on the AGRA website. Um, so feel free to go and try to, you have to make a user and I think you can download it. Um, but if not, I will be sharing this presentation with you guys at the end of our two day workshop. And as I mentioned previously, today we'll be looking at mound and boulder corals. Um, so again, these are um, agra presentations, they're not mine, we're just using them as a resource. And today we will be talking only about stony corals. And um, I will invite you to raise your hand if everybody is familiar with um, a coral and the anatomy of a coral, feel free to say no. Um, so that we can we go a little bit more into detail with that. So feel free to raise your hand if you're completely familiar with um, corals. I see several hands raising. All right, wonderful. So I guess we'll just briefly go through the anatomy of, of corals. So corals are colonial organisms and they are made up of tiny little um, organisms called polyps. And so you can see here in the image, these are expanded polyps. And then in the bottom image, we have contracted polyps. And these polyps um, have tentacles and they can use these little tentacles to um, get food that is floating in the, in the water but a lot of the energy and the food that the coral has um, in its majority is produced by the algae that lives within their tissue called Susanthelli. And they have what is called a symbiotic relationship where they both benefit um, from this relationship. So today we'll speak about stony corals and they're called stony corals because they basically excrete um, a hard calcareous skeleton. Um, have in beach after a storm, you might find some of the, the skeleton that's left over from corals. Many people in Roatan have them as decoration in their houses. So um, this is basically the skeleton of the coral. And if you have any of those in your house, um, maybe right now or later, take a look at them because there you can really see the little holes where these polyps would live if the coral was alive. Um, so most re refilling corals form colonies of interconnected polyps. And they vary a lot in shape, size, the color of the polyp, um, and the colonies are used to identify these corals. So we'll talk a little bit about the features that are important when it comes to coral identification. Okay, the next slide. Um, so again, we'll be looking at the shape and size of the polyps. Um, these can be visible when we, when we see the skeleton, but they're also visible when we have live um, corals and we can see that when we go diving. So next time you go dive, take a look closely at, at how these po polyps look. During the day, you will not see the polyps. Um, the polyps will be contracted in most species except for the pillar corals. Um, but at night, if you've had the opportunity to do some night diving, um, this is a great opportunity to see those tentacles out and about. So the shape, the size of the polyps are visible in their underlying skeleton and they have these little, I guess we could call them little teeth or little partitions that are called septa. So remember this as we go because the septa, the size of the septa, um, the, the width of the septa, this will be a very defining characteristic. Um, we'll also be looking at whether the polyps are round as in, in, as in this Montessori cavernosa or do they have long ridges and valleys like in brain corals? We will not be talking about ridges and valleys in this workshop. Um, we'll be talking about ridges and valleys tomorrow when we go through all of the meandered corals and the flower corals. And um, the, uh, some of the polyps can be elliptical or can also be Y-shaped and they can also have short reticulated ridges, ridges and valleys. For today, um, because we're looking at boulder and mountain corals, we'll only be focusing on the shape of the polyps, the shape of the colony, the size of the colony, um, and septa. 
So what do we need to look for underwater? First, well, colony shape. Is it a massive coral? Is it uh, encrusting coral? Is it, does it have heavy plates? Um, does it have little plates? Um, so like a lettuce coral. What is the size of the colony? This will be very important because there are certain colonies that can reach um, something like three meters. There are colonies that can be quite small, maybe you know one meter or maybe centimeters. So that will be a defining characteristic as well when we're having questions on whether it's this or that. Um, what's the colony surface? Is it a smooth surface? Is it a bumpy surface? Does it have ridges? What's the size of the polyp? Is it a small polyp? Is it a big polyp? Are the polyps um, out or are they inside? Are, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. The polyp shape, are they round? Are they elliptical? Are they irregular? Are they Y-shaped? Um, polyp color can also be an indicative, but it's something that I personally don't use that much because I think um, color can be um, very changing underwater. It really depends on the person. Um, there's been a lot of memes going on about, does this look green to you or does it look another coral? color, so I don't really rely on color as much. But it can be a characteristic. Are they brown? Are they tan, yellow, olive, green, red? And again, septal shape, those little teeth that we talked about in the pre previous slide. Are they fat? Are they thin? Are they smooth? Are they tooth? Um, so I will be talking a lot about septa, so get familiar with, with septa. And just go back a little bit, and septa are basically these little partitions um, in, the, in the polyp. And um, to make things easier, I think, um, we'll be using AGRA codes. And um, these AGRA codes are made up of the first letter of the genus. So most scientific names are two parts. They have the genus and the species name. And we'll be using the first letter of the genus, in this case, Orbicella, O. And then we'll use three letters of the species, which in this case are OFAB. So Orbicella fabulata, the code is OFAB. So I will be mostly referring to corals as code names. Um, I not very familiar with common names. I'm so, so sorry, but I do encourage you at the end of this presentation, if you have the Human and Deloge books or if you have Caribbean Reef Life, go through them and go through some of the common names that, that might be easier for you. For this particular workshop, we'll just be using um, the Agra codes. Um, and this is just a little warning that we don't have to put too much attention about, but it says that the Montessori annularis complex of species annularis fabulata franci, which we'll go into detail, don't get scared yet, has been reclassified as the Orbicella annularis complex on the basis of recent molecular and morphological analysis. Montessori cavernosa retains its genus name. What does all this mean? <laughs> It basically means that as you know, scientists develop new techniques, as we're getting better at doing genetic studies of corals, um, we are seeing that some of the corals that we have aren't really what we thought they were. So they're, change, they're changing names as they go. Um, as I've been trained in Agra, I've seen several co corals that have changed their code or have changed their genus. Um, so just bear in mind that this is an evolving field and that corals might be changing names um, in the future. All right, so do we have any questions so far? Let's see, before we move on, um, let's see where the chat is, apologize. All right, so we don't have any questions. Feel free to put them on the chat box or in the Q&A as we go. So the first coral, oh, Amber Miller raised your hand. Um, feel free to for this, just to type them on the chat box if you have questions. Um, and I will, um, I will read the questions out loud for everybody. At the end of the webinar, we'll have a bit more time where you guys can actually make questions. If you have them, I'll allow you all to talk. All right, so the first coral that we're gonna go through is called Orbicella fabulata or OFAB. And um, this coral is characterized by very small um, round polyps. We can look here in the close up. And these polyps have little walls that exert out. These polyps are what we call outies because they're out. And um, something that is very particular is the way that the colony looks. 
it kind of looks like um i like to think or i'll give you my tips as we go but it kind of looks like a little skirt there at the bottom um that's how i remember it and um they do have these like little mounds um and they kind of look like like a mountain that's how i remember it the colors can be anything from greens browns grays they might have also fluorescence and these are fairly large colonies they can reach four um, to five meters for those of you that are more familiar with feed that's 12 um, to 15 feet and um, the surfaces are smooth and they do have these kind of like little ridges that kind of remind us of mountains um, with bumps aligned in vertical rows. And going back to Jared's question um, about, you know, light and corals needing light, depending on where we are, if we are fairly shallow, we know that there's more light availability, we will see um, corals growing like large mounds. But if we are going deeper in the reef and there's less light, we will see them grow as um, call it like flat plates. Um, so don't get confused. These are both um, the same species, just with different light availability. So this is our first coral, Orbicella uh, fabulata or Ofab. Now we're gonna move on to its cousin, Orbicella annularis or Oan. They also have small round excerpt polyps. And the characteristic for Oan is that they're only alive at the tops. And they kind of remind me of a bouquet of flowers, you know, the way they, they can grow because sometimes with bio erosion on the sides of the, of the coral, they might lose um, some tissue there. So they kind of look like little clumps of, um, and they only have polyps that are alive at the top. So they have thick plates at the colony sites or bases under low light conditions. Colors can be light brown or yellow brown. These are also fairly large colonies. They can reach three to four meters or nine to 12 feet. And this is what I was saying that it kind of reminds me of a bouquet of flowers because since they're only alive at the top on the sites where their polyps are not alive, they have like sponges or algae that are growing on them and that causes bio erosion and in a storm, they can kind of fall apart a bit. All right. so. People might confuse Oan or Orbicella annularis with Orbicella fabulata. How can we tell them apart? So how, how does it differ from OFAP? Well, we know that Oan subdivides to form these little columns with basal plates under low light conditions and live polyps on well eliminated column tops. They don't have that skirt that I was talking about because again, they're only alive on the tops. And um, they do tell us that they are lighter in color. So um, Oans tend to be more of a yellow tan color, whereas Saviolatas tend to be uh, darker brown hues. This one's Orbicella franxi or Ofra. And I remember this one and because um, it's a bit not very good looking in my opinion, right? It has these like polyps that are lacking suicantelli. So they're you might think that they're bleach, but this is common for the species. They do have um, small polyps that are lacking suicantelli. Um, so it kind of reminds me a bit of Frankenstein. So that's how I remember um, Orbicella franxi or Ofra. So they have irregular bumps with large excerpt polyps that are pale and they do not have suicantelli or that symbiotic algae. Large polyps along colony margin. They have irregular mounds, crust or thick plates. So they're not smooth like the Orbicella um, annularis, or sorry, Orbicella fabulata. And apparently they're very aggressive spatial competitors. We know that corals compete for space and light in the reef, so they might overgrow other species of corals. Again, this is something that we will see repeating itself through different species. Areas that are shallow, high lit, they grow as irregular shaped mounds. And then areas where are, that are deeper and low lit, they might grow as thick um, lumpy plates, but they will still present those um, white polyps every now and then. So people might confuse the Ofra with the Ofab. Um, so how is it similar to Orbicella fabulata? Well, they both have um, little bumps on large mounds, crust. They can grow as, sorry, they can grow as mounds, crust or thick plates. 
But how is it different? Orbisella franksi has much larger polyps than Orbisella fabiolata or OFAB. And um, the polyps on bumps are even bigger, irregularly shaped, and they often lack that suicentelli. So when we're looking at OFRA, we're looking at those really irregular mounts and those white um, uh, polyps. Bear in mind that they are bleached. I mean, in theory, they don't have um, suicentelli, but they're still tissue. This is not to be confused with tissue loss. Um, there is still tissue, but this tissue is white. Um, so how can it be similar to OAN or Orbisella annularis? They can form large columns or thick plates, and they're different because the OFRA has much larger polyps that lack suicentelli. Polyps along growing margins are even larger, and OFRA is a bit of an aggressive competitor, but this wouldn't be something that we would see uh, on our dives. We're not really saying, oh, wow, that's a really aggressive coral, right? So stick to the more of the features that you're seeing. And I think we have some questions. Orbisella is a genus of corals that belongs to the Merulinidae family. Michael, I am not very familiar with the families. I will have to Google that, but it could be. It could be. All right, let's see. All right, so now it's time for a poll. So take a look at these corals and I will go ahead and launch a poll and you will select what you think coral A is, coral B is, and coral C is. So you should be seeing the poll on your screen um, and I'll give a few minutes so you guys can um, take some take some look at these corals and see if you can identify um, what code each coral is. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and close the, the poll soon so that we can look at the results. All right, so we see that most of you said that A is Orbisella annularis, most of you said that B is OFRA, and most of you said that C is OFAB. Awesome. So most of you were actually right. Look at the results now. So A is Orbicella annularis. We're seeing those clumps at the top that are alive, but on the sides we're seeing by erosion. We're not seeing live polyps. B is Ofra. It's looking a bit weird. It's really bumpy um, and it's hard to tell, but there are some white um, polyps that are lack tissue. And C, there's Orbicella fabiolata. Um, that has those skirt looking, those kind of like mountains. There are bumps, but the surface in itself is smooth. Awesome, so well done everybody. Um, all right, so the, there might be some complications. Sometimes there are intermediates um, of these um, species, but we won't go into too much detail on that. And when in doubt, when you don't know what species it is and you might be doing a monitoring with us, or you might be doing some data collection, just leave it at the genus level, which is Orbi. Um, these three species are within the same genus, which means they're closely related um, and they are an intermediate susceptible species. So if you tell me I saw a species of Orbicella presenting symptoms of stony coral tissue loss, that's enough information for me. Um, so don't get too caught up on not knowing the specific um, species. All right, so now we're moving on to another species. Now we've moved on from the Orbicellas. This is a different type of coral, another genus. The genus is Solenastrea furnoni, and the code is SBOU. And um, polyps 
are separated by a smooth interpolate surface. This is basically this tissue between polyps. All right, this is the interpolate surface. Cream to light brown, polyps are slightly darker than the interpolate surface. So we can see kind of the darker circles of the polyp and the lighter in color interpolate surface. Smooth or irregularly shaped mounds. And um, this is a smaller um, colony. It says up to 50 um, centimeters, 20 inches, but we do have this one that's one meter. So, you know, take these sizes with a grain of salt. Um, so this is S. Brunoni. And the way I remember these is because they kind of remind me of a noni fruit. If you guys live in Roatan and you've seen noni trees, um, S. Brunoni kind of reminds me of a noni fruit. Um, and because it does have those um, irregular mounds, then, um, oh, wait, sorry, guys, I have a little comment. This bottom left picture looks different. The spaces are wider, and I thought this was a sponge that was invasive. Um, you might be confused with um, some invasive, um, Jesus, I can't remember the name right now, um, like, uh, sorry, Corallium, not a Corallium, or sorry, it might be like some invasive hydroids and things that might look similar, but I'll go back to this slide. These are definitely all um, corals. This is also a, co a coral. Um, I can't really zoom into it, but if you go really close, you will see um, the polyps. They're just, this might be a picture that was taken during a night dive where the tentacles might be um, extruded, but these are all corals. All right, so some people might confuse it with Orbicella franksi. This has a smooth interpolyp surface. Bumps on mounds lack enlarged colorless polyps. Lighter colors with distinctively dark, darker polyp centers um, and smaller colonies when fully grown. So this is how we would defer them from as Ofra, sorry. And also remember that Ofra um, has exerted um, polyps and it does have those polyps that are lacking um, a color. All right, so onto another poll. Let's see, which is which? Um, stop sharing results, sorry. And let me find the other question. All right, so which is which? Awesome, I'll give a few more seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results with you guys. So let's see, most of you said that the first color coral is an Ofra and the right Coral is a S. Boo. And um, I'm happy to report that most of you were actually right. So this one's an Ofra. We can see, although both of them are bumpy, right? Um, you can kind of see if you look closely some of those um, polyps that are lacking tissue. And on the right, we see the S. Bononi or S. Bu. Um, you can see that that interpolyp surface is much lighter than the polyps themselves. And there is um, another species within this genus, Slonastria hyades or hyades. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Um, and the code is S H Y A, S H Y A. Um, I haven't seen this one. Um, I, I presume it's maybe not that common. Um, it has lighter colors, polyps with distinct wall, um, and it does have larger polyps than the S. Boo, and it's uh, an encrusting coral, so it doesn't grow as a mound. And um, now we're moving on to one of my favorite corals. I think they're just so beautiful. 
This is Montessoria cavernosa or MCAV. And they kind of remind me like little gummies for some reason. They just like, you know, really plump. They have these really, really large round um, extrude polyps. The colors can be anything from brown, yellow, brown, green, or gray, sometimes fluorescent co colors. Um, and they're also fairly large colonies um, from, you know, can be anything from three meters to, and in feet, nine feet. This is the typical coral that we see with that goby, that neon goby on top. They normally see these, I'm not saying that this is a characteristic, but I normally see these um, neon gobies hanging out on the, on the Montessoria cavernosa. Like other corals that we've discussed, in shallow highland areas, they grow as mounds or columns. And in the deep low lit areas, they go as, grow as flattened massive plates or crust. So again, um, for the MCAV or Montessoria cavernosa, remember those really plump, large um, exerted polyps. And something that's very neat about these corals is that sometimes when you're diving, they might fluoresce in natural light. So we will see them like bright, bright red or orange. Um, so take a look at these sometimes. You can see this, this natural light. So this is what it looks in natural light. This is what it would look with a strobe light. Um, so this is a very um, neat characteristic of MCAV. They have fluorescent proteins in the polyps that produce greenish or orange red fluorescence that is sometimes seen under natural illumination, especially at depths. So that was N MCAV or Montessoria cavernosa. And um, now we're moving into Dicrocenia stochesi or DSO. And um, we have debates with colleagues. Some say that they look like little worms. The polyps look like little worms. I feel like it reminds me of ramen for some reason. Um, so that's kind of how I remember it. It's very exert. They have round, they have elliptical corals, they have elongated polyps, sorry, Y-shaped polyps. So you can see that no um, polyp is the same. They come in very different shapes and sizes. The colors can be cream, yellow, or brown. They can be mounds, but they can also be regular in shape, sorry. Um, so remember, Dicrocenia stochesi, very regular uh, polyp shape. And how does it differ from Montessoria cavernosa? I really don't see the similarity, but some people might confuse it because they are pretty large polyps. Um, but do remember that Montessoria cavernosa has those very round, similar polyps, whereas um, Disto has very irregular polyp shape. The septa, which we discussed previous to the presentation, are these little teeth right here. The septa on the vertical are not sloping. So if you think of some of the polyps, the, the septa might be slanted a bit. Here, they're, they're vertical, um, very straight and they are lighter in color, fully grown colonies are um, smaller. And um, again, with um, low lit areas, we might see them grow as plates and in more, in more, sorry, shallow with better lighting area, we might see them grow as um, some columns. So colonies with flattened plates and many similar round polyps have been also called Dicrocenia stellaris. So this might be another, um, this is another species of Dicrocenia, but again, when in doubt, same with the Orbicellas, just put D-I-C-H, just the genus name. And this is one of the highly susceptible species together with mace coral, pillar coral, and um, uh, brain corals. So keep an eye on, on the distos um, for us as well. They're fairly small colonies. I haven't seen them too large here in Roatan. So again, we're ready for another poll. And tell me what these are.
I'll, gi I'll give a few more seconds. Right, I'm gonna stop um, the poll now. So last seconds to put in your answer. All right, and poll, and let's see. So most of you said that they're all disto. Well done. This is meant to be a bit of a trick question. All of them are um, Dicosinia stochasi. Some of you were a bit confused with Orbicella fabiolata. Remember that Orbicella fabiolata has kind of the same shape of polyps. And S. Bernoni um, doesn't have irregular um, polyps and S. Bernoni has that interpolyp surface that we were talking about. So these are all dicosinias or D. stochasi. So as you can see, they're all elliptical polyps, round polyps. Here we see some really large um, elliptical shaped polyps. So remember um, for this, species, polyp size and shape is a big characteristic. And now we're going on to another um, species. This, the common name of this coral, I do know a few common names, is golf ball coral because they're quite small. They're really, really small. Um, look at that, 10 centimeters to four inches. And they're called Fabia fragum or fra fra. Um, somewhat exert round elongated polyps, some are white shaped. So these can be easily confused with disto. Um, but we do have to look at the size. Um, if we do have like a juvenile um, or a, an early recruit of Dicosinia stochasi, then we might confuse it with F Ephra. The septa have small teeth um, and these are smaller um, sorry, the polyp walls are not as vertical as they are with the disto, so that's another characteristic, and pale yellow to brown. And as again, the size of these, um, they're quite small. So how can it be similar to disto or disto kesi? They both have exert round elongated polyps. Some are Y-shaped and they can be similar in color. So how do we tell them apart? Well, the pullet walls protrude far less in the Fabia fragum. You can see here, um, each one of these is, uh, is a polyp, and we can see that the wall does not extrude as much as they do with the disto. The septa with teeth on the summits and inner sides, so we can see these tiny little septal teeth right there. And Fabia fragum, when fully grown, is much, much smaller than disto cassie. All right, so guys ready for another poll? I'm going to launch the poll now. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll now. So you have a few more seconds before I end the poll. All right, so I'm gonna share the results with you so you guys can see what everybody answered. So most of you said that A is disto, that B is MCAV, and that C is Fabia Fragum. Let's see. Yep, excellent. So well done, everybody. Um, A is disto. Um, why do we know that? Because it has irregular polyps that have polyp walls that are very vertical and they exert. 
we have then Montessori Cavernosa. And again, those neon gobi gobies are like the giveaway, but really the reason is because we have these really plump, round um, polyps. And C, we have Fabia Fragem. And I meant, I should have said this at the beginning. So Agra likes to play some tricks on us. And the size of the photo, as you can see, not all the photos are the same size. And that's to let us know that the C coral or Fabia Fragem is a much smaller coral than the other corals. So keep that in mind. I'm sorry I didn't mention that, but the agra folks can be a bit sneaky. All right, so the next coral that we're gonna go through is um, Cirerastrea Cirerea or S-Cit. And um, these have small sunken polyps that are called innies with very thin septa. So the septa is really hard to tell. This I apologize, these agra images are not the best, but you can kind of see um, there the septa a bit. The coat is acid. The colors can be gray, yellow, brown to brown, so they're uniform colors, and they're normally rounded mounds. These are fairly large corals, two meters or six feet in feet. And um, right now, these you might be seeing some of this um, pale or bleach acid colonies, and they do not bleach like other corals do. They actually pale um, or become a purple in, in color. So some paler bleach colonies are fluorescent, and so they might look pink or light uh, purple. Smaller colonies may be encrusting. And its cousin, its much, much smaller cousin, is Cirerastrea radians. So they also have sunken pinched polyps called innies and they have a thick septa you can see there these are the little septa pale polyp walls and the centers are dark so if you looked at the acid and i'm going to go back a bit um you can't really tell they kind of look uniform in color i guess that the center does look a tiny bit darker but not much but here you can clearly see that polyp center right there um, and the, the polyp walls um, are lighter in color and then the polyp is much darker. These are um, mostly crusts, low mounds or unattached nodules. They do not grow in large mounds as acid. So that's how we can tell them apart. They're much smaller. If you guys remember, acids grow up to two, two meters, whereas S rads can grow up to 30 centimeters. So how do we tell s rad from s -cid? And this might be really difficult. I think this is one of the hardest ones. Um, so don't feel bad if you can't identify them right away. I think that they're very clearly both similar. So if you don't know if it's s -cid or s rad, if it's Cidera um, or Radiance, just leave it as, you know, SID, S-I-D-E, which is the, the genus. Um, so the septa are fewer and thicker in S rad, pinch polyps, some elongate with darker centers, and the fully grown S rads are quite um, smaller and flat. So this is a hard one. Let me see, stop sharing results, sorry about that. And let me launch the poll. So which is which? All right, I'll give a few more seconds.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results with you guys. So most of you said that this one right here is S did and the little one is S rat. Um, some of you got it a little bit backwards. Some of you thought um, they were both S rat or S did. Um, I'm going to stop sharing results and let's see what the results were. All right, so you guys were right. This one is acid. We see they're both in ease, but here we can see um, that clearly pale um, polyp wall with those dark circles. So we know that it's S rad. Acid has more septa than the S rad. And we can see that this one's encrusting. I know this is hard to tell, but this one's encrusting, whereas this one we can predict that it's a, a larger um, colony. So those are some giveaways um, to tell us. So well done, everybody. Let's run the next poll. Which is which? And just a little tip, remember what I said about Agra putting images um, in different sizes to tell us which one might be bigger than the other one. So keep that in mind. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. All right, so most of you said that the one on the left is Ezrat and the one on the right is Esid. Some of you got a little bit backwards. Some of you thought they were both Esid. Some of you thought they were both um, Esrat. So let's see what the results say. So the smaller one, um, the one on the left is Ezrat. We know that they have the, the pale um, polyps, interpolyp surface with those dark um, polyps. And then the acid has still those innies, but we can't tell um, that dark, dark circle. And again, I gave you the little tip to look at the size. So Ezrat tends to be um, smaller than acid and Ezrat tends to be encrusting whereas acid tends to be large uh, mounds. See. All right, so now we're moving on to another one. And I, this is one of the few that I also know the common name. Um, this one is commonly known as blushing coral, Stephanosinia intercepta or Sint. Um, and it's called blushing coral because if you get close to them and kind of move some water on them, don't touch them, the polyps will retract immediately and it will give a color change and it will look as if the coral was blushing. So they have round sunken polyps, so um, what we called previously innies, because they're inside. They're not like the Montessori cavernosa where we have those exert polyps that are very plump. Um, the brown color is most intense in the polyp centers and they appear to blush when polyps contract, which I just mentioned. So this is why this one's called blushing coral. They tend to be thick crust and irregular mounds. I've seen them mostly here in Roatan as, in, as um, thick crust, so they tend to be encrusting here. Um, and I think that the giveaway here is that inter, inter polyp surface and those, those very dark um, polyp centers as well. 
And they might be confusing with that S boof because remember S boof does have that interpolyp surface as well, that pale color interpolyp surface. So how are they similar? They both have small round polyps with light brownish colors that are most intense in polyp centers. They do have that interpolyp surface as well, but how do we tell them apart? And this will be quite difficult from a picture, but when you're in the water, um, the scent or the blushing coral has sunken polyps, whereas the esbu, the Selenastra brunoni has outies. So the polyps are out. Scent tends to have crust and low mounds that have relatively smooth surfaces without large bumps. Remember that Solanastra brunoni tends to be quite bumpy. Um, as I said, it kind of reminds me of a noni fruit. Um, and I think noni fruits are not that good looking. Um, they might also confuse it with S. brad um, because it is encrusting. So how are they similar? They both have those sunken polyps with dark polyp centers. And um, how are they different? Well, Stephanosinia intercepta tends to blush. Um, when the polyps contract, it kind of looks like blushing. Here we see um, that blushing motion, right? Half of it is contracted and half of it is out. So we see that change in color. And they don't have those pinched polyps as um, as rat. They also have large crusts and mounds when fully grown. So keep those in mind. All right, so I believe this might be the last poll of our workshop for today. So let's launch the poll. I'm going to give a few more seconds. Remember again what I mentioned about the size of the image tells a little a little bit about the size of the colony. I think this might be the hardest one of the night. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results with you guys. So 59% of you said that A is synth. Some of you thought it was acid and some of you thought it was s rad. For coral B, most of you thought it was s rad and some of you thought s boo and synth as well. And for coral C, most of you thought that it was S boo. All right, let's see how close everybody came. And most of you were actually right. Well done, everybody. Um, so remember, Scent has those innies, polyps that are inside, but they have that interpolyp surface there, that white. And the polyps tend to be um, darker at the center. They can be easily confused with S rad, but here they're giving us a little tip that coral B is a small encrusting coral. So we can kind of deduct that it's, it's um, Pseudonastraea radians or S rad. And um, C, again, S brunoni, it does have that interpolyp surface, but they are quite bumpy. Um, so 
we can deduct that it's S Bononi or S Oda. And this is actually the end of our first part. Um, I thought it was going to take us a little bit longer, but I think we actually went quite fast through these. So now I'll actually give you guys some time to type some questions. We can go back through any um, coral species that you had doused. We can discuss them a little bit more in depth. And um, in case there weren't any questions, then I'll go through a series of different resources that I think um, might be helpful for you guys to, to continue your practice. So feel so. One of the best resources I've seen out there is definitely the AGRA website, Atlantic Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment. Um, and on the webinar section, they have um, several webinars and they have a section on stony coral tissue loss disease. And these are all really wonderful uh, workshops. I highly recommend them, especially this one, Identifying Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease from September 15th. I think that this is a very comprehensive webinar that goes through all the susceptible species, all the characteristics, and it has a great methodology to get to whether you, you can conclude that it's stony coral tissue loss disease or not. So the website is agrra.org. Um, it's full of um, webinars. They also have these really nice, and I'll click on them so you can see them. They also have this one, it's a much, longer um, webinar if you have the time this is about an hour long um, but it also goes through how to identify stony coral tissue loss disease. Another interesting feature of the AGRA website is what they call the AGRA dashboard. Um, here let me zoom out a bit. I hope that you guys can see it. Oops, sorry about that. And here you can see all of the reports that um, people have given of stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, you can see here our report for Honduras. And I encourage you, if you go diving and you want a report, you can actually yourself send your report to AGRA with pictures and they will verify if it's stony coral tissue loss disease um, or if it's not, and they will put it up on the map. But also do send us a message as well because we are here in Roatan so that we can actually go to the site and corroborate whether it's stony coral tissue loss disease or not. So feel free to go to the AGRA website. Here in the reef monitoring page, you will find um, all of the coral reef monitoring tools. They also have training tools and here they have the coral training and it should have um, all of the presentations that we just went through, but also they have a really neat feature, which is the flashcards where you can uh, practice your core identification. And I encourage you to go dive, take a look at these corals. This isn't something that you will immediately be familiar with. It does take time and a lot of practice. So be patient with yourself. Um, and I guess if we don't have any questions, let's see if I have any questions here in the Q&A box, then this is probably it for today. I will see all of you guys tomorrow. So tune in um, at the same time at 4 p.m. Honduran time, 6 p.m. Eastern. And if you do have any questions for me directly, I will put my email on the chat box. So feel free to send me an email as well if you have any questions, if you have any pictures for me to look at. Um, I thank you all for your time and I will see you all tomorrow. Bye everybody. Hi everybody. Welcome back to our second part of our Coral ID workshop. Um, we're going to give it a few minutes for a couple of people to connect. We currently have 15 attendees. Um, but if you were here yesterday, you know that I love polls. So I'm going to launch a little poll to see if you guys were here um, yesterday. And to tell us a little bit about where you're watching from. So most of you were here yesterday. So congratulations. Um, this is your second part. Um, those that weren't here, we'll do a really quick review of some of the corals that we saw yesterday. Um, most of the people watching us are from Honduras. We have some folks from the U.S., some folks from Canada. We have actually three people from Guatemala. Um, and we have a couple of people watching us from other countries. So on the chat box, let us know. Oh, somebody from the Philippines. That's amazing. Wow. Hi, Justin. Wonderful. I'm going to stop sharing my results.
Um, for those of you that weren't here yesterday, my name is um, Gabby Ochoa. I'm the program manager here at the Marine Park, and I will be your instructor for today. Um, you are currently muted as we are on the webinar setting. Um, I can unmute you if you want to make the question yourself, but it's much easier if you just type the questions on the Q&A box or if you comment on the chat. Um, let's see, somebody's watching us from India. Hi, Caitlin, that's amazing. What time is it in India? That's crazy. I'm super excited to be with all of you today. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen and we're gonna do a little pop quiz um, of some of the corals that we saw yesterday. There won't be polls for these corals. Um, so just on the chat, um, let us know what coral you think it is. Give me one second, I'm gonna find my corals. Awesome. Okay, so um, first corals. Let me know which one is the top one and which one's the bottom one. And you can go ahead and, and type it on the chat. And I'll be giving you some tips as we go. So the top one is an encrusting coral. Um, both of these um, species have what we call innies, which are polyps that are retracted. They're not outies. Um, and the top one is a much smaller coral than the bottom one. The bottom one is a larger colony. Um, it grows in mounds. So we have Anna is saying that the top one is Cirera Cirera Cirera, Thomas Ramsey saying S rat. We're actually looking at two species. One is an S rat and one is an S did. So which is which? Which is the top one? Feel free to put it on the chat. Jared, you can put it on your chat. Um, you can put the answers on the chat or I can allow you to talk um, fairly quickly. Let's see. Jared, go ahead and um, ask your question. You're muted at the moment. S rat, the first one, sorry. Okay, S rat, and what's the bottom one? Um, looks like Cidera. Cidera, Cidera, sure. Cidera, mm. acid. Wonderful. Acid, yeah. Well done, Jared. You're absolutely right. I'm going to go ahead and take you off the microphone now, and then we'll move on to the next corals. Awesome. All right. So Jared was right. The top one is the S rad, Cidera, Cidera, Radiance, and the bottom one is S Cid, Cidera, Cidera, Cidera. If some of you just said Cidera, you're actually both right because they're both in the same genus. So if we're not sure of what species it is, we can leave it as S Cid. That's perfectly fine. Well done, everybody. Patrick also said S rad top. Well done. S Cid bottom. S Cid bottom. Excellent. Kathy said what Patrick said. Well done, Patrick. And now we're going to move on to our next pop quiz. So what do we think this one is? And I'll be giving you some tips as we go. So remember, this coral has irregular polyps. Some polyps are in circles, some polyps are elliptical. Um, they tend to sometimes have Y-shaped polyps as well. The walls of the polyp are quite high and vertical. Awesome, so I'm getting some answers in the chat. Trip is saying it's Disto, um, Dicostinia stochasi. Leah is saying Orbisella fabiolata. Kathy is also saying Disto. What do the other folks think? <laughs> Kathy is saying it looks like ramen. That's what I think too, but um, somebody was telling me that they look like little worms, but to me, that looks like ramen. Um, so well done, everybody. This is a Dicosinia stochesi, Disto. Uh, well done, Jared, everybody who said Disto. Um, well done. Moving on to our next pop quiz. What do we think? This was my favorite color or uh, coral, guys. Remember I told you that I absolutely love this coral because it kind of looks like gummies. Uh, 
All right, so Kathy's saying MCAV. Uh, most people are saying MCAV. Patrick is saying Montessori Goomer Gummy Vernosa. Uh, Trip is saying MCAV. Leah is saying MCAV as well. Well done. This is definitely a Montessori Cavernosa. Um, we see those really plump, large polyps. And remember, I told you guys that sometimes in natural light, these colors tend to have a fluorescent red tint. So well done, everybody. This one's a Montessori Cavernosa. This is a tricky one. Um, it does, didn't look like this, because remember I told you, so the agro pictures that are, are a bit outdated, um, but this is an encrusting coral. It has that inter um, polyp surface that's much lighter than the polyps themselves. And um, this was meant to be a tricky one. And don't be scared if you're wrong. All right, so I have so far we have an SID and we have a SINT. Any other guesses out there? Patrick is saying SINT. Stephanosinia intercepta. All right, so I'm not getting any more answers. Um, and uh, Tripp and Patrick were right. This is a Stephanosinia intercepta or SINT. And the giveaway is that inter uh, polyp surface that is much lighter than the polyps themselves. This one is the one that I told you is also called blushing coral because the polyps tend to retract um, when water is moved around them. All right, so moving on to the next one. What do we think that one is? So it has very large polyps. Yeah, and Kathy, Kathy is saying Frankenstein, Ofra. Exactly. That's exactly how I remember Ofra. Oops, sorry. I stopped. I apologize. I'm going to full screen this. Let's see what everybody's saying. Kathy's saying, my tips are the best. Thank you so much. I hope they help you. This is how I remember these, these corals. Tripp is saying, Franksy, Ofra, Orbicella Franksy. Excellent, guys. It's an Orbicella Franksy. And we know that because it has very, very large polyps. It has larger polyps kind of on the little skirt of the coral. Um, it has those corals that are lacking uh, suicanthelli or the symbiotic algae and therefore look like they're bleached. This is a perfectly normal coral. It can be confused with disease sometimes, but I just want to clarify, this is a perfectly normal coral. All right, let's go through another one. I think, believe this is the last one I have, my little pop quiz. What do we think this one is? Okay, so I'm getting OFAB, Orbisella Fabiolata, SBU, SRAD. Um, so I will tell you that these, it is a tricky one because we can't look at the polyps, right? But Kathy's saying, oh, now I see the skirt. You're right. So it does have a skirt. It does have a fairly smooth surface, kind of looks like mountains, like rolling mountains. Um, so it's definitely an Orbisella Fabiolata. So with that, we end our little pop quiz. I'll just stop sharing real quick um, and let you guys know that for those that weren't here um, yesterday, we are hosting this webinar so that people can identify coral species that are susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease. This is a disease that is affecting different reefs around the Caribbean. It's now present in 16 countries and it's characterized by slothing of the tissue um, that leaves this, a bare skeleton, like a white skeleton. And what's very special about this disease is the way it spreads. So it starts with the highly susceptible species, which 
yesterday we only saw one highly susceptible species, which is Disto, Dicrocenia stokesi, and then it moves on to um, the brain corals, which we'll discuss today, and then some of the bolder corals, which are basically the Orbicella, Orbicella fagulata, Orbicella nularis, Esbu, Sint. Um, so yesterday we mostly looked at the intermediate susceptible species, except for Dystokenia, Dicrocenia stokesi, sorry. And today we will look at some of the highly susceptible um, and some of the other brain um, corals. So with that, um, does anybody have any questions about the corals that we discussed uh, yesterday? No questions? Yeah, if some of you are watching us on your phone, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you so that you can um, make the question yourself. Okay, so it seems like we don't have any questions. We're gonna move on to the to today's um, corals. Here we go. Let me make the screen bigger. Sorry. Okay, so today we'll be looking at meandroid corals um, and flower corals. So we're really not going to go into solitary corals, although they are part of this presentation. I will not be discussing them because um, they're not highly susceptible or intermediate susceptible. I do want to say that there's over 60 different species of corals. We are only looking at approximately 20 something, which are the highly susceptible, intermediate susceptible. So if you want to learn some of the other branching corals, you want to go through some of the lettuce corals, feel free to go through the Agra website, download the slides, and you can learn a little bit more about that. Um, I will be sending you guys a survey. So in that survey, let me know if you would like to go through all the four parts um, of identification and in the future we can consider that. But for now, we'll just be focusing on those susceptible to stony coral tissue losses. This is presentation is from the Agra website, agrra.org. Many of you asked me yesterday. Um, so this is the website where you can find it. I do not own this presentation. I didn't make it. I'm just using it as a resource um, to share with you some coral identification. And um, we'll just do a little reminder from yesterday of what we'll be looking at underwater to be able to identify corals. So first of all, we'll be looking at the colony shape. Like we looked at, for example, the Orbicella fabiolata that kind of looks like a large mound. It kind of has a, a skirt on the bottom. So we'll look at whether these are massive corals that grow as a mound, as a column, or heavy plates? Are they encrusting corals? Are they plates? Or are they branching? Colony size um, will be very important as well. Do they grow pretty large? Do they grow pretty small? We know, for example, from the S rats and the S sids that the S rats are quite small. They don't get that big. So if we're confused, size can help us determine what species it is. Colony surface, we'll be looking at, um, is it a bumpy surface like the Ophra? Or is it smooth like the Orbicella fabiolata? Are they rich like the lettuce corals, which we won't be discussing today? Polyp size, um, we'll look at whether they are small, whether they're big, whether they're outies or innies, whether they're interconnected or not. Uh, polyp shape, are they round, elliptical, irregular, Y shape, or all of these like in Dicrocenia stokesi? We'll also look at polyp color, and I did discuss yesterday that I tend to not focus so much on color because it's depends on the person, what might be brown to you, might look tan to me. Um, so although it's an indication on the species, I try to leave it as a last resource. So are they brown, tan, yellow, olive green, red? And again, we'll look at septal shape. Are they fat, thin, smooth, or tooth? If you don't know what a septa is, don't worry, we'll go on about that on the next slide. Um, all right, this is just a little reminder. Um, as I said yesterday, a lot of the coral names are changing as we go. There's so much research that's being done in terms of the genetics of these corals that um, what we might thought was, you know, uh, a Montessori cavernosa in a few years might be called something else. In fact, all the Orbicella, Orbicellas used to be called Montastreas, uh, but now through science, they determined that they're now should be in, grouped in the genus Orbicellas. Um, and also, we will be looking at the carry comp or agra codes. Um, and these are four letter codes that are made up of the genus and the species name. Scientific names have uh, a genus name and a species name. Think about it as your first name and last name. So in this case, we'll use 
the first letter of the genus and the three letters of the species. So for example, Mandrina jacksoni is M. jack, or Bisala fabiolata, O. fab. And the reason why we're focusing on agricodes is because it's a bit easier than learning scientific names and um, they're universal in theory. Everybody in the Caribbean will know what an AMJAC is or what a OFAB is. And also if you are um, gonna be volunteering with us with the Marine Flag, you're gonna be doing rover diver surveys with us. You're gonna get trained to volunteer um, to respond to stony coral tissue loss. It's important to be familiar with these codes. So today we will be looking at meandered corals and um, these are basically colonies that have interconnected polyps. If you remembered the corals that we saw yesterday, you could clearly tell where the polyp was, right? It was a round polyp with its little mouth. Here we see all of these arrows are pointing to polyp mouths and they're all connected. So there's no difference between them. And they're separated by ridges, which are right here. I'm pointing them with my mouse. So get familiar with these terms because most of the species that we'll look at, I'll talk about the valleys, which are where the polyps are, and we'll talk about the ridges, which are these parts over here. So um, the characteristics of the, of the corals that we'll see will have to do with, are the ridge um, vertical? Is the ridge large? Is the valley um, deep? So keep those terms in mind. And this is our first coral. Clopophilia natans, or CNAT, and this coral is characterized by very narrow grooves along the tops and midway down the sides of the ridges. What do they mean by that? There, if you look, well, this is probably not the best image. We'll look at other images, but there is a little narrow, small groove here on this ridge. I like to think that it kind of looks like somebody went with it with a little pencil and made a little line. Um, so it's a very, very narrow groove. The ridges right here have narrow septa and narrow septa connects the polyp mouth. So right here, the little arrow is pointing to a polyp mouth. So these are the septa, these little lines right here, they're quite narrow and we have a little narrow groove on the top of the ridge. These are very beautiful um, corals. I believe, well, somebody can help me, maybe Trip can help me what the common name is. I think they're giant boulder brains or something like that because they are really massive colonies of brain corals. They can reach up to three meters, 10 feet in length. They're basically the largest brain coral that we have out there. The tissues um, may have two colors or two shades. Um, and they may, can also have stripes as well. So they vary a lot in the way they look um, underwater. Very similar with other colonies that we were looking at, depending on, the, on where we're finding them. If they're shallow, high lit areas, they'll grow as mounds. If they're deep, low lit areas, then they'll grow as thick blades. Um, I think I have some questions, let's see. Trip is saying boulder brain. Okay, so that might be the common name. And I did mention yesterday, if you want to get familiar with the common names, i terrible at them, but make sure to go through the Few Manda Loach book or Caribbean Reef Life by Mickey Charteris if you're here in Roatan and go through the common names if that's easier for you. Um, for the rest of the presentation, we'll just focus on, on the agri-codes. So this is CNAT. Let's see, next one. And this is our next coral. Um, Manicina areolata or mare and um, this is a very small colony 20 centimeters and um, I've only seen them close to seagrasses I haven't seen them particularly on the reef they have a very distinct groove in the ridge top so right here and there are usually found like free living um, this means that they're sometimes um, not necessarily fully attached to the substrate their coloration can be yellow brown, gray or green. They might have lighter patches in their ridges, ridge tops, but remember this is a very small, um, a very small colony. And it says here a little note, attached colonies on the reef are also known as Manicina maiori. We will not get into much detail, but these are normally see um, in the lagoons next to seagrass beds, um, not fully attached to the substrate. So, it might get confused um, a bit with, with the CNAT that we just saw. And just to, not to confuse you guys, but these are both um, mares. These are not CNATs that we're looking at. 
So how does it differ from Popofila natans or Sina? Well, Manisina aerolata or mare has a much wider groove. Remember that the groove in the sea knot is very thin. And the polymouths are not connected by septa. So they're much in the deeper there. Colonies are smaller when fully grown. And it's time. It's time for our first official poll. So let's see what you think. All right, I'm gonna give you guys a few more seconds. Make sure to put on the poll what you think they are. I feel like I might have left a title, so give me some time to go into that. Sorry, I was muted. I apologize. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now and share the results with you guys and share the screen as well. So that we can go through these corals. Okay, so most of you said that they're Sina and Mare. You are right. Um, and let's look at why that is. So as you can see, the first image, we see that very narrow groove in the ridge. That's the characteristic of CNAT. We have the little septal here, septa connecting the polyp. And if we look at the other one, we don't have that narrow groove. We have a very particular group over there. It's actually a much wider group. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my poll. And again, I guess for those of you that weren't here yesterday, I did mention yesterday that Agra likes to play some tricks on us. So Normally, if the images are of different size, Agra is trying to tell us that one's smaller than the other one. So the smaller one was Mare and the other one was CNAT. Okay, so CNAT and Mare. Okay, next coral that we're going to see is um, Diploria labyrinthiformis or DLAB. And um, DLAB has a very prominent groove along the top of the ridge. So again, remember, CNAT has a very, very narrow groove. DLAB has a very, very deep groove over there. So don't get confused. The darker here, that's where the groove is. And the lighter uh, color here, this is where the polyps would be found. So sometimes that groove can be deeper or wider than the valleys themselves. So the space here between the ridge tends to be much wider than this area here where we would find the polyp mounts. They are tan to brown colors and sometimes the valleys can be uh, a different shade and be fluorescent. And um, here we can see just different examples of the variation in terms of the pattern that they might present. So they, they might look slightly different, but definitely get close to them and look at that group. That will be um, a characteristic for this coral. They're medium-sized corals, one meter, about three feet. Um, and I, I guess some people could confuse them a bit with um, mare. Um, number of thing that makes them different is definitely the size, right? This um, Diploria labyrinthiformis is a much larger coral than mare. Um, Diploria labyrinthiformis or DLAB has narrower valleys right here. They're pointing at the little valleys where if you look really closely, you can kind of see the little tentacles there from the, the little polyps. Grooves and all the ridges can be much dip, deeper and wider. 
tentacles, often partially expanded by day. So here you can kind of see. Um, sometimes they might not be out at, in the day. Um, and the colonies, are, again, are larger when fully grown in comparison to mare. So on to our next poll, which is which? Okay, I'll give you guys a few more seconds. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just for a very short. Okay, I'm ending my poll now. All right, so which is which? And I apologize, I have to stop sharing my screen because I realized that I left the titles on and I might be giving you guys the answers. Um, so some of you said that it's the first one is DLAP and the right one is CNAT. Some of you said that the left one is CNAT and the right one is DLAP. And most of you said that the left one is mare and the right one is DLAP, and that is the right answer. Again, remember that the picture size tells us a lot about the size, like if one is bigger than the other one. So here what they're showing us is that, that the mare one is a much smaller coral than the DLAP. And if you look closely, you can see that there's some little tentacles over there. All right, so we're gonna move on. So Mare and DLAP, and we're gonna go to another poll now. Let's see. One second, let me find my polls. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. So if you haven't voted, make sure to vote now. Okay, and I'll share the results. So some of you said that the left one is CNAT and the right one DLAP. Some of you said, most of you said that the left one is DLAP and the right one is CNAT. And some of you said both CNAT, let's see. So the answer is that the left one is DLAP and the right one is CNAT. Um, how do we know that? Well, the DLAP has a much narrow 
much narrower groove, sorry, over there. Whereas the C nut has a very thin, almost, it's, you can't even see it in this image, but there's a little line right there. This is a very, very narrow groove. The valley is much wider in the C nut than it is here um, in the D lab. And Mary, do you have a question? Let me see if I can allow you to speak your speak for your question. Okay, feel free to ask your question. You just have to unmute yourself. Maybe. Okay. Okay, I guess you can ask your question later or you can put it in the chat box. All right, moving on then. We have another one. Let's see, I'm launching my poll now. Sorry, that was not it. All right, here we go. Ay, Dios santo, no sé por qué sale. Haceme un... Right, I'm giving you guys a few more seconds. Yes, and I apologize, Kathy. Yes, I know that my questions are not anonymous, so I'm asking a colleague to put all the questions anonymous so that it's not, it's a bit harder now. There are anonymous, according to the, do you want me to erase them? Erase the title? I think you have a title, which is which, that's what it doesn't come out. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna share the results with you guys. All right, so we have that most of you said DLAB and DSTO, and I apologize that the, that the answers are at the top, um, is what I use to know which one's which, um, but I've asked a colleague to try to erase the questions to see if it can be a bit more anonymous and we can actually um, do more, more less, less knowing the answer and more guessing. All right. Yeah, she said, Kathy said, I think it was at the top. I never noticed until this one. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, no, I need to make it harder for you guys. <laughs> okay, so you guys said that it's DLAP and then DSTO. Some of you said that they're both DSTO. Um, some people said CNAT DSTO and DLAP CNAT. Let's see. Okay, so the right answer is that the left one is DLAB and the right one is DSTO. And remember that the brain corals, their polyps are connected. There's no like individual polyps. And in the DSTO here, the one that Kathy said kind of looks like ramen, each one of these little ones is a polyp on its own. Here, there's all kinds of polyps connected. Again, well, size does tells us a little bit about these corals, but uh, remember that that coral, uh, meandered corals or brain corals, all of their polyps are connected. 
All right, and so here is just a little reminder on recent molecular and morphological analysis. Um, the next two corals that we're going to see, um, Pseudodiploria strigosa and Pseudodiploria clivosa, used to be Diploria strigosa and Diploria clivosa, and that has now been reclassified into a new genus. So as I was saying, these uh, fields are evolving, the names are changing, so um, these used to be Diplorias, now they're called Pseudodiplorias. And the first one is Pseudodiploria strigosa or peace tree. And some of the characteristics about the squirrel groove along the ridge top is very narrow and often indistinct. The colors are yellow, brown, green, brown or bluish green. Valleys may be lighter or fluorescent. Mounds are thick cross or massive plates, um, can reach up to two meters. And I'll give you some tips on this one because I think that this one can be easily confused um, with um, Colpophilia natans. So Colpophilia natans has a very narrow groove on the ridge. Pseudodiplorus grossa or P Street basically has no groove. It's almost hard to see it. It's indistinct. It doesn't have a groove, but you wouldn't be able to see this until you get really close to the coral. In this image, it's, it's hard to tell. Like most of the species, shallow, high-lit areas, we will see them grow as, grow as mounds or thick crust. And in deep, low-lit areas where there's less light, um, they will grow as massive plates. Some people might confuse it with um, D-Lab and c -Nat and Mare. <laughs> so how do we tell the difference between these? The groove along the ridge top is very narrow and often indistinct. So if you see, it's basically no groove there. If this was a Cena, we would see that very thin groove made with a little pencil, um, and it has very narrow valleys. All right, so I think I'm, I apologize. I think I might have missed this poll, so I don't have a poll for this one. So let's pretend that the left one is A, B, C, and D. So let me know what you think these are. Which one do you think A is, B, C, and D? And you can put it on the chat, or if I have a brave uh, volunteer that wants to raise their hand, I can allow them the microphone and they can tell us what they think of these corals. So feel free to put it in the chat. Um, or if I have a brave volunteer that wants me to put the microphone on, they can tell me what they think. Right, so I have some answers from Kathy, from Trip, from Patrick. Okay, any other answers? And I'll give you a little tip. So the bottom right over here is a smaller picture. That means this is a smaller coral than the rest of the other corals. Okay, so Kathy said that uh, we have, let's see, going up to Kathy's. We have DLAV. History, CNAT, and Mare, left to top. Okay, so DLAB, History, CNAT, and Mare. Trip is saying DLAB, CNAT, Mare, and Peastree. Patrick is saying DLAB, History, CNAT. Oh, oh, sorry, you did different, Patrick. You did top left, top right. Okay, so top left, D right, top right, Peastree, CNAT, and Mare. Okay. Kathy saying minor same as Patrick also, Gabrielle, DLAP, History, CNAT, and Mare. All right. Awesome. So some of you were right, some of you were a bit off on some of the corals. Let's see what the answers were. So the top, the first um, on the left is DLAB. We see that the little tentacles are out and about. You can kind of see if you get close, you can little see the little tentacles. And we see that that groove on the ridge is quite deep over there. 
the next one here, bottom left is C naught. We see the very narrow groove over here. If you want to go by color, then we know that some of the C naughts have that fluorescence um, in the polyp area, and they tend to be two colors. But I mean, if you look at that narrow groove, then we can tell it's a C naught. This one, because the image is smaller on the bottom right, we know that it's a smaller coral than C naught, D lab, and P three, and we know that it's a mare. And then the last one, it doesn't really have a groove on the ridge at all. And the valleys are much narrower than the CNAT. So we know that that's a P3. So well done, everybody. And I'm going to repeat. So D lab, CNAT, mare, and P3. And I apologize for not having a poll there. I'm trying to see if you guys are on your feet. All right. So the next one is Diploria clivosa. This is um, very closely related to Cerro Diploria strigosa. It has narrow ridges that lack groups. So this one definitely doesn't have a groove at all. Um, Cerro de Ploria Strigosa had an indistinct groove. Cerro de Ploria Clivosa has no groove at all. So shallow, narrow valleys, um, yellow, brown, green, brown, or bluish or gray. Valleys may be lighter than the ridges or a different color or fluorescent like in the bottom. And um, the thing that helps me tell um, Cerro de Ploria Clivosa apart um, is sometimes the depth of where it's found. I, I've seen Cerro de Puerto Clivosa in much shallower areas. And also they have these like knobs. I think I might, if I, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's called knobby brain coral because it kind of has these knobs um, and it's not a smooth um, surface. So as you can see here, it has flattened or irregular lumpy crust. So you can see here all of those little lumps. Um, usually about one meter to three feet, sometimes larger. And as I said, they have a very shallow depth of range. So you're not going to really see Cerro de Puerto Clivosa uh, if you're diving, uh, if you're doing a wall dive or if you're quite deep. These I normally see in much shallow areas in the lagoon um, or in the, in the front reef or in the back reef. Sorry, I apologize for that. Okay, so how does it differ from CNAT and Peace Tree? They have smaller ridges that lack groups. So Cerro Clivosa has no grooves at all. They have smaller valleys. Right here you can see very, very small valleys. Septa are thinner and more numerous, but for us to see septa, we have to get really close to the coral. They are flat or lumpy crust found in shallow depths only. Okay, so let's see which is which. One second. And I am sorry, guys, it looks like I don't have a poll for that one either. I'm sorry. Um, so go ahead and tell me on the chat. You can put the, the names from left to right. So Trip is saying P Street, P Clee, and C Nat. Okay, any other volunteers? If anybody's brave enough wants to tell me what they are, I can put them on the mic and they can tell me what they think they are. So which is which? Hmm. 
All right, Caitlin is saying CNAD, Pickley, and D Lab. History, Gabrielle, Pickley, CNAD. Kathy's not sure about the first one. Say maybe D Lab, Pickley, and CNAT. Okay. So if you're a bit confused with Pecli or Pseudolipoea clivosa and Pseudolipoea strigosa, remember that Pseudolipoea clivosa has knobs. It's kind of knobby and it doesn't have a groove. I know that these pictures aren't very close up to kind of see that groove, but you can tell that one of these is, as Trip is saying, prickly or um, bumpy. So let's see what they were. So we have P3, Pickley, and CNAT. So most of you had them about right. Um, some people are a bit confused, but remember, Cerolipoea strigosa um, has a very, almost not, no groove there. Um, sorry, it's the strigosa, Cerolipoea clivosa is kind of bumpy or prickly, like Tripp was saying. And here we have a CNAT. We can kind of see the groove there. Again, I apologize, these pictures. Um, Sometimes they're not the best for close-ups. All right, so now we're going with Mandrina mandritis, and I should have mentioned all of the brain pearls that we just saw are highly susceptible species. This one as well, Mandrina mandritis, um, M. Mia is also um, a highly susceptible species, and especially here in Roatan, this is a species that we are observing is presenting um, symptoms of stony pearl tissue loss disease um, right now. So if you're in Roatan, if you're in the water, take a look at this coral. Um, if it's looking a little bit sad, not looking too happy, take a picture, uh, note the dive sign and send us um, an email. So um, I've given this webinar several times and every time we have it, people come up with different names or different tips. And somebody told me that they thought this coral kind of looked like Pringles. So that's how I remember it too. So if you look at it, it kind of looks like little Pringles stacked up here on the bottom. So they have a very, very wide ridge with large, thick septa. So look at these ridges right here. They kind of look like mountains, right? And the septa right here, which are the little lines are quite, quite thick. They have very deep, narrow valleys. You can see right here. And the colors are pale yellow to dark orange or dark brown. With this species, you can really go with color. This, they don't really vary much in the coloration that we will see. Um, they can grow as thick plates or cross mounds, but also short columns. I am, the older corals might be looking like columns. They're actually very aggressive towards other corals. So they are um, highly competitive. And here they show us a picture of this one that's uh, competing with space with this parietes and is um, killing it actually to compete with space, for space, sorry. And um, it could be confused with Mare Manicina areolata, but again, Mandrina mandritis has a very thick ridge right here and they have those really thick septa. So what my colleague at that point called Pringles. So they have those deep narrow valleys over there um, with narrow septa connect polyp mouths. So the mouths would actually be somewhere around here. During the day, you will not see the tentacles um, out of the polyps, um, but at night I have seen them with their tentacles exposed. So I should have a poll for this one. Let me double check. All right, so I'm launching the poll. Let me know what you guys think.
Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a few more seconds. So if you haven't answered the poll, please do so. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. Share the results with you guys. And um, most of you said that the left one is M M M Mandrina, sorry, Mandrina Mandrides, Mamina, or, and that the other one was Mare. So let's see if you guys were right. Yes, you were, Mandrina Mandrides and Manisina Arilata. Well done, everybody. The great majority of you guys got it right. So that's excellent. And in this image, actually, you can see the tentacles exposed over here. And so in, within the Mandrina genus, we have Mandrina jacksoni, which is um, closely related to Mandrina mandrides. It's what I call small Pringles. So the other one was big Pringles. This one's small Pringles because the septa is much smaller. The ridge is also smaller. So they have a low, narrow ridge with short, thick, widely spaced septa. They have wide, shallow valleys. They have white tentacles that are usually conspicuous. That's when you can actually see them. Um, and they have um, the valley is usually lighter in coloration than the ridges themselves. And, and these ridges are quite smaller compared to Mandrina mandrides or MA. So Mandrina jacksoni, they're usually pale cream or pale yellow. Mounds, thick plates or crust, short columns or regular shapes. Um, it can get up to one meter to three feet. Um, for this one, I think color is also um, a giveaway as well. So how does it differ from Mandrina mandrides? It has shallower, wider valleys lower narrower ridges with lower and more widely spaced septa polyps are more likely to be visible by day um, so these um, the mandrina jacksoni you are more likely to actually see the tentacles out and about um, but i usually tend to go with the with the ridges because mandrina jacksoni has a much um, narrower ridge the septa are also smaller some people might confuse it with Cerodipura clivosa because of the way that some of the Mandrina jacksoni colonies grow. They might be uh, bumpy or um, prickly. So remember, Mandrina jacksoni has wider valleys, wider ridges with larger septa, polyps more likely to be visible by day. So let me get my poll ready for you. And then let me know what you think. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right, a few more seconds. If you haven't voted, please do so now. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll now and share the results with you guys. So let's see, we have a tie. Um, so some of you said Mandrina mandrides and Cerepura clivosa. 
of same number of you thought that it was M. Jack and Mandrina Mandrides, and some of you thought that they were both um, Mandrina Mandrides. Let's see. And I think that you guys might be mad at me because I think that the answer was actually not there, but let's see if I was wrong. So Mandrina Mandrides and actually M. Jack. So I apologize, I tricked you guys. The answer wasn't really there. Um, so I apologize for that. So Mandrina Mandrides and M. Jack. And how do we know that? Well, M. Jack has that white space in between. The ridges are much narrower than on the Mandrina Mandrides. And if we were to get up close with these, we would see the tentacles out and about. All right, so we have another one. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I'm gonna give you guys a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll now. Okay, so most of you said that the left one is Mandrina Jacksoni and that the right one is Cerro de Puerto Clivosa, and most of you are actually right, so well done. Some of you got a little confused with Mandrina Mandrides um, and M. Jack, but remember that Mandrina Jacksoni has that white in their valleys and the ridges are narrower. So it has like small Pringles compared to big Pringles. So again, I wanna remind you guys, this is one of the highly susceptible species. So when you're in the reef, if you are here in Roatan, these are the ones that I would recommend you take a look at, the Mandrina mandrides, Mandrina taxoni, um, all of the brain corals as well, and some of the ones that we're gonna discuss in our next slides as well. Okay, so I guess I also said that Montessori Cavernosa was one of my favorite. This one's also one of my favorite, Dendrogyra cylindris or pillar coral. Um, I love them because they're just massive colonies um, and they always have their tentacles um, out. Um, normally I had them seen with them retracted, but normally they have their tentacles out. Um, I see that Travis, you've raised your hand. Would you like to speak or would you like me to, or would you like to write your question on the chat? Okay, moving on then. So Dendrogyra cylindris or D-cell has tall columns above a massive base. Polyps are usually expanded by day. So it's very common that you will see them. They kind of look like hair. The color is tan, yellow, brown to dark brown. Again, like the Mandrina mandrides, they they're always the same color. I think that this one's one that's really hard to misidentify. Let's see some questions there. Yes, Travis is saying, I used to know them as pillar corals. They are called pillar corals. That is their common name and their scientific name is Dendrodria, Dendrodria sorry, cylindris or D-cell. So their common name is pillar coral because of those tall um, columns that we see. Okay, so when the polyps are not out, you could confuse them with some of the mandri mandrina species. 
um, it, it can be hard, but it, it can happen, especially because it's very uncommon to see these pillar corals without their tentacles out and about. So the polyps are usually fully expanded by day. They have very deep, narrow valleys. Ridge is usually white and flat on the top. You can kind of see them there, the little ridges. Colonies are much larger when fully grown. So let's see what you guys think with this poll. Right. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. I think a few of you still haven't, haven't voted, so please do so. Okay, I'm gonna go and end the poll now. And share results with you guys. So let's see, most of you said that A was Mandrina Jacksoni. Some of you thought it was Mandrina Mandrides. Um, don't get discouraged. Normally these are hard to identify. So if you just said Mandrina, that's good, that you're on the right track. Um, let's see, which is coral B? Most of you said pillar coral. Wonderful. Some of you got a bit confused with Dipura labyrinthiformes, but remember that pillar corals grow, have those columns that grow out, whereas Dipura labyrinthiformes does not have that. And coral C, most of you said Mandrina mandrides. Some of you were a bit confused with D-Lab, um, but overall, most of you got them right. So well done. This is really good. And again, just repeating myself a bit here, I apologize, but do remember that these are highly susceptible species to stony coral tissue loss disease. So these are species that we have to put extra attention on when we're in the reef. And with pillar corals, I do recommend that you take lots of pictures because sometimes um, stony coral tissue loss disease symptoms can be confused with white plagues. So it's great to take pictures and if you're not sure to come back the next day so that you can see how the disease has advanced if it has advanced. So I recommend that you note the dive site, take a picture and send us an email with those images. So well done everybody on these. All right, so the next one, oh God, I have so many favorites. This one's also one of my favorites, I'm sorry guys. Um, I just think it's so beautiful. It's called Musa Angulosa or Mang and they kind of remind me of lips, you know, like really fleshy lips. They have large fleshy polyps that are alive only at tops of the stalks. So if you think of them as flowers, these are actually flower corals. Um, and they have very large septal teeth, which you can see here. So these are the septa and then the little spikes there are the septal teeth. And you can actually see them under the tissue here. The colorations can be opaque grays, greens, yellows, browns. They can also be mottled. They can have these like little spots there. Sometimes they can have fluorescence, um, pinks or reds. They can get up to one meter. They're, as Mandrina mandrides, very aggressive spatial competitors. And the other flower coral that we'll look at, and this one's actually also a highly susceptible species, is Eusmilia fasciata or EFAS. And um, they have round to ovoid, sorry, or elongate stalked polyps that are only alive at the tips. 
they have smooth septa visible through the tissue. So remember, Musa angulosa has those teeth, so it doesn't have smooth septa. It has like toothy septa. And then the coloration can be yellow brown, brown or gray. They're much smaller than Musa angulosa. And the flowers themselves, the little polyps, are also smaller. So in the flower corals, each one of these is a polyp. And these are, in my opinion, the most beautiful corals to see at night when their tentacles are out. They really do look like flowers. They're really beautiful. So if you have an opportunity to go night diving and you encounter one of these, send me a picture because I just love them. Um, they can get confused with uh, Musa angulosa, but remember that EFAS has soft polyps only alive at the tips. So normally we will see them alive here and then we'll see some bio erosion on the side, similar to Orbicella nullaris. Um, sorry, that's how they're similar, I apologize. How are they different? Polyps are smaller and less fleshy. Colors are uniformly pale and they lack those septal teeth. So that's how we can tell them apart. The flowers themselves are a bit smaller. The, co the colors are a bit muted and they don't have that septal teeth. And I'll just go back so that we can take a look at the, what I mean by those septal teeth are those little spikes right, right there. All right, so which is which? One second. Let me know what you think. Travis, if you have a question, feel free to type it or let me know if you would like to ask it yourself and I can um, open up the mic for you. So if you unmute your microphone, you can ask the question. I think I made a mistake. I meant to say that the one on the left is uh, actually the one on the right is Musa angulosa. Okay, so and what do you think they are? So you think you think the one on the right is Musa angulosa? Yes, and the other one is um, Ifas. Okay, awesome. Well, guess what? You're right. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to end the poll now. And as I was telling um, Travis, the right one is Musa angulosa and the left one is Ifas. So the Musa angulosa um, has fleshier. Um, flowers, I guess we could call them that. They have the septal teeth, and whereas the Esmilia fasciata does not have the septal teeth, the flowers are smaller and the coloration is also a bit muted. And guys, with that, we come to the end of our coral ID. So you guys are now, um, you are now able to identify all the species that are um, susceptible to stony coral tissue loss, um, at least the highly susceptible and intermediate susceptible. You are now familiar with the agricodes. Um, and so congratulations to all of you guys um, for watching both of them if you did and for following with all our polls. We really, really thank you guys. Um, I'm gonna leave some space right now. If you have any questions, feel free to put them on the chat or put them in the Q&A box. comment from Kathy. She's saying, thank you. That was super informative and entertaining and helpful and all good times. Can't wait to be back looking out for the reef. Awesome, Kathy. You are very welcome. I love to do these. Um, we will be having another one um, at the end of the month, but that one will be in Spanish. Um, so if you know anybody that wants to be in the Spanish course, let them know. And I will, these have been recorded and we will put them on our YouTube channel so you can revisit them. I will also be emailing you the slides of both presentations um, tomorrow. 
or actually Monday to be honest. Um, so I'll send them to you on Monday. And Patrick is saying, thank you. Now I'm confident on Coral idea. I hope so. And somebody, Justin saying, thank you for the discussion, loud and clear, nice and detailed presentation. I hope more about Corals. Yes, I will send them to the, to the email that you registered on with the, on the Zoom. That's the email where I'll send it. Okay, so I do not see any other questions. So with that, I will leave you guys. Thank you so much for everything. I will leave my contact here, Gabby at roatanmarinepark.org. So if you have any questions or concerns, do let me know. I will also leave the email where you can email us Sony Pro Tissue Loss Disease Suspicion Pictures. So if anything that you think looks suspicious, you want to know more about it, please send it to this email. There we go. So I see one question. Um, Leah saying, is it all right to use your personal email and the Stony Pearl tissue email to send photos? We send two triple presented symptoms. I send them both to you, but I'm sure if it's the right email. Um, I haven't received them and the Stony Pearl tissue losses this email gets forwarded to my email. Um, it could be that maybe you put .com instead of .org. Um, but if not, yes, feel free to send them to me personally as well. Yes. Um, Actually, we do not give certificates just because this isn't an official agra course and we didn't cover all of the corals, um, but I can send you a participation um, diploma or certificate if possible. So if um, I'll look into that and if possible, I'll send it to your email, Justin. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Leah, send me those pictures to my Gabby email. That's no problem. And um, see you guys next time. Thank you for everything.